Hello, I'm Paul Swindell and the host of Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast and welcome to this first episode in the season two. I will be continuing this season in the same vein as season one with a mix of episodes which I hope you will find interesting, although I will look to broaden the range of subjects covered. Of course, we'll have the personal stories from survivors and others directly affected by a cardiac arrest, but in the coming weeks, I'll also be releasing episodes on subjects common to many going through the recovery process, so things on memory, fatigue and mental health, for example. We'll also be having some episodes on innovations in the field, such as a low-cost AED and the ICD shock monitor. This first episode continues where last season ended, with a giant of resuscitation. And in the next hour, Professor Jerry Nolan, the head of the European Resuscitation Council, gives a fascinating overview on many subjects within the field of resuscitation. An essential listen, I'm sure you'll agree, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast with me, your host, Paul Swindell. Today I'm speaking with Professor Jerry Nolan, who's a consultant anaesthetist and intensivist at the Royal United Hospital, Bath. He's the current chair of the European Resuscitation Council and a past chair of the Resuscitation Council UK and past co-chair of ILCO, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, I think, Jerry, is that right? Uh, that's correct, Paul, indeed. And you're also the editor-in-chief of the Resuscitation Journal magazine and a co-author of a number of books on and uh, scientific papers on resuscitations. You're a very, very busy man by the looks of it. And I believe in 2016, this was all summed up very nicely by the fact you were given an honor- honorary title of a giant of resuscitation. Yes, I was. Well, I was very grateful and, and honoured to to receive the title. It's something that the um, American Heart Association awards on average once a year. In fact, it's done sort of f- five people every five years. But it was a, a huge honour to receive that, uh, particularly from my m- American colleagues. Could you tell me briefly about your background and your interest in uh, resuscitation? Yeah, so as you said in the introduction, my specialty is anaesthesia, but I also uh, work for about half of my clinical time in the intensive care unit, which is a very common thing in the United Kingdom where clinicians are usually both anaesthetists and and intensivists. And I had uh, inevitably exposure to to cardiac arrests during my early years as a doctor, particularly in those days for in-hospital cardiac arrests. And um, I gradually developed an interest in that field. I had a a particularly notable mentor who I feel I I really must mention, Dr. Peter Basket, who incidentally was a very close friend with Professor Douglas Chamberlain, who I I know has um, done one of these podcasts for for you recently. And it was he really that that instilled huge interest in in the topic of cardiopulmonary resuscitation in, in me. And of course... It's no coincidence because there's a lot of crossover between anaesthesia and, and CPR for reasons which we, which we may come on to when we talk about the history of the topic. But I've maintained that interest ever since and, and been able to, uh, you know, very fortunate, be involved in quite a lot of research studies, for example, in CPR, whilst carrying on my, my day-to-day clinical activities as an anaesthetist. Having someone who's there to inspire you, like Peter Basket, then I can see uh, why your your interest is in the subject, really. Yes, I, I, it's hugely important, and not just in medicine. I'm sure this is true in in, in all areas of, of um, you know life and, and, and work. If there is an individual who's you know very very inspiring, then then it just drives you to become more interested in that topic, and I think that's incredibly important. And I hope that you know in turn I can do the same for for. Um, you know, people training underneath me at the moment. I'm sure you will. From what I understand, the average age of someone who has a cardiac arrest is around 60. Is that about right? Yes, I think that's probably true. Obviously, there's a broad range around that, of course, but I think that that's probably true. Certainly for for 
a cardiac arrest that, that, that occurs out of hospital. I mean, I was going to say, because maybe a uh, hundred years ago, someone wouldn't necessarily reach 60 or may that actually be the top and it's only really perhaps post-war that we've begun to go into the the 70s and the 80s so is this a a modern problem that we've created for humanity because of we're living longer essentially yeah it's it's that's a very interesting question paul i I think if you go back through history and i mean you know very briefly historically resuscitation in its very earliest stage was was all about um, people, and this was two or three centuries ago, I guess, people involved in, in you know, burn, smoke inhalation, poisons in coal mines, and, and of course, then more recently, drowning. So that those would all be completely different causes of, of somebody having a cardiac arrest to where we are now, which is more, much more, of course, about heart disease and you know, primary heart problems. And I guess in the early days, going back a few centuries, they would have been very much younger people because, of course, they would inevitably be people who are out there either exposed to you know being in water or mines or whatever whereas whereas now with an old, an older population who are perhaps more likely and more prone to develop heart disease then that's where we see i think the changes so it's not just a change in the age of, of patients having cardiac arrests but it's to do with the cause of the cardiac arrest that's moved from perhaps a primary breathing issue if you like albeit caused by drowning or smoke inhalation or whatever to something which is much more likely to be a primary heart problem and of course most commonly it's because of blocked coronary or, or heart arteries what sort of percentage is heart problems do you know for out of hospital arrest now and this this will be true for most parts of the world about two-thirds of patients that, that sustain an out of hospital cardiac arrest will be will be caused by some sort of heart problem and the major, the vast majority of those are blocked arteries, as, as I've said. You can have other problems with the heart muscle itself, or, or you can have problems with the, the electrical activity in, in the heart that can suddenly go wrong. But those are all directly heart problems. And then the, other, the others will, will be a mixture of, of causes. Uh, some will be because of primary breathing problems. Um, some will be things like still drowning is there sadly particularly in some parts of the world and there'll be things like you know car crashes and and sadly of course you know suicides as well for for someone like myself who's uh idiopathic are we seeing increasing numbers of those because in in, in the sudden cardiac arrest uk group i think we've got an unusually large proportion of people who are in the same category as myself i think we're roughly a third of the survivors are, are, are idiopathic and when you say idiopathic, you mean some sort of rhythmogenic problem? Well, that that's the diagnosis they've been discharged with. Basically, they don't know why it occurred. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so, so I, I guess the doctors love the term idiopathic because it gives a very, very posh term to, to something which is essentially saying we haven't really a clue what's going on. Um, and so it's true i I think sadly in 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 many cases there's no obvious cause i suspect most most would be some sort of rhythm problem which is why as as i'm sure you're aware a number of such patients will be perhaps fitted with you know implantable cardioverter defibrillators you know in case it should happen again but that's uh, and i suspect that might be a group that we the term idiopathic, I hope, as time goes on, will be given to a f- fewer and fewer people because, of course, hopefully we should be able to find out what the issues are. And whether there are even perhaps in genetic related you know, aspects to it, we probably learn more about that you know, almost every day. I suppose the more research we do in these areas, the more we're going to find out. And maybe 20, 30 years down the line, we will be able to put our finger on nearly 99.9% of all of the cases. I think so, and I think the, the I'm, I'm not an expert in the area of um, genomics, which is you know the genetic makeup, if you like, of individuals. But uh, it, the, the, there's data coming out, and, and in, you know information about that coming out, you know, almost, almost every day. And I and I think you're right. I think eventually we'll probably be able to solve most of these the so-called idiopathic cases. We'll, we'll be you know we will understand and give an appropriate uh, name for. Okay, so you're um, current chair of the European Resuscitation Council and you, you've been um, previous chair of uh, RC UK. Can you tell us about those organisations uh, and what they do for us? Because I suspect most lay people possibly won't have heard of them. They would have heard of organisations like the British Heart Foundation or, or the American Heart Foundation. 
Yes, you're right, Paul. And I think the reason for that is historically the Resuscitation Council UK, if we start with that one first, has been much more a healthcare facing organisation. So it's been there particularly to provide training in resuscitation and what we would call in hospital advanced life support for doctors and nurses. The Resuscitation Council UK is perhaps one of the the oldest, I guess, uh, of resuscitation councils in, in Europe and was really heavily involved in um, establishing, along with some other European colleagues, the European Resuscitation Council. And I think what's happened since then is many, many European countries have followed the, the model of the United Kingdom and have set up um, national resuscitation organisations that, that, that really serve, I guess, a, um, a number of purposes. So they may start out being very healthcare-facing organisations, but with, again, coming back to the Resuscitation Council UK as an example, it's becoming more and more public-facing now and looking more and more at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and recognising the importance of the community response when when somebody you know, sadly has a cardiac arrest because it's incredibly important that bystanders are aware of it, you know, recognising it, alerting the emergency medical services and getting on providing bystander CPR because the, those interventions have got a, a far higher chance of uh, increasing survival rate uh, from cardiac arrest than, than anything we do later in hospital. So that's the kind of thought processes, I think, going on with the Resuscitation Council UK at the moment. And that is then going out really to the rest of Europe. And of course, now through the organisation you mentioned in the introduction, which is the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, it's a, it's a global initiative. So the European Resuscitation Council is in turn a member of ILCOR, and ILCOR comprises you know, virtually all regions of the world. So we have a truly international network now to provide guidelines for both healthcare professionals and the public um, across the world. So uh, the RCUK is, is sort of part of the jigsaw of that, if you like. How is the UK doing in terms of uh, its statistics, I suppose, and the technology and the, the protocols that we're putting together? And how does it compare to the rest of Europe and the world? Well, an extremely good question, Paul, and, and inevitably one that's dif- difficult to answer with, with, with certainty, I think is the right word. Interestingly, just published literally in the last few days is a so-called Eureka 2 study, which is a study of cardiac arrest across Europe, looking at the incidence and survival rates. And the short answer to your question is that, is that if you look at the European countries that have reported into that, and I guess there must be 20 or so countries that have that have provided information and data for that study. The United Kingdom sits just above the sort of middle, I would say, when you look at overall survival rates from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The UK sitting probably around about 9% overall survival rate. But the range is up to the Netherlands, which is sitting at around about 18%, and then down at some of the other European countries sitting at at as low as 5%. But of course, you know, I would be very cautious in the way those results were interpreted, because it's extremely difficult to make sure that we are comparing like with like, apples with apples, if you like, because there can be subtle differences in the way that these cardiac arrests are reported. In case that sounds confusing, I'll give you the the most obvious example of that. And that is that in some places, it might be that they record all the cardiac arrest events that the the emergency medical services attend, whereas in others, they may only record those where the emergency medical services, by that I mean the paramedics, for example, actually initiate a resuscitation attempt. And in in the United Kingdom, for example, If you look at all the out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that the paramedics get called to, they only start resuscitation in about 40%. And in case that sounds horrifying, well, the reason is, you know, sadly, there there are those cardiac arrests where, um, you know, somebody is is clearly beyond, beyond saving or in some circumstances they've made it clear that they don't want to be resuscitated, for example, a whole number of reasons. 
So, so that nine percent that you quoted earlier of the, of the UK, the survival, is that of the forty percent that have started? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, for the UK data, it's definitely those where there is a resuscitation um, a, a attempt. Yes. So you're saying 40% started. Do we know how many in, overall in the UK occurred? Yes, the figure that's, and of course there's some variation around the figure, but it's about 30,000 resuscitation attempts by the EMS each each year. Okay, so that, what would that correlate? That would mean, to? Well, that would mean 60, so 60,000 plus actual cardiac arrests. And again, I must emphasize we're talking about out of hospital now because actually there are probably very similar numbers of in-hospital cardiac arrests on top of that. Oh, that was one of my questions, which you preempted nicely, which was to do with uh, why, why do we differentiate between in a hospital and out of hospital? Because in my group, we don't. It's if you've had a cardiac arrest, you've had a cardiac arrest. And I see a lot of the similar sequelae that people go through and they, they want the same sort of care and help and information where that actual cardiac arrest took place doesn't really matter too much to them. Why, why does it matter to the medical profession? So, again, a very good question. The reasons are that they are in many respects quite, quite different, at least in terms of cause. And for, for, for many out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, these are, are very sudden events. And, and as you well know, in, in many cases, extremely sudden. So they, they happen in, in people who had no idea that they had any form of heart problem to start with. So suddenly collapse out of nowhere. And again, we've said about two thirds of those will be mainly because of a, of a primary heart problem. The in hospital situation, whilst there are a few that would fall into that category, the vast majority are patients who are very sick with a number of other diseases, such as, for example, infection or sepsis, which of course is um, you know, a term that you hear a lot now in, in, the, in the media, or breathing problems such as pneumonia that then lead on to the heart stopping i.e. a cardiac arrest. But it's not because that the heart is the primary problem, it's because there's some other major illness within the body. That means that even in in the hospital setting, if somebody has a cardiac arrest, it, it's still often quite difficult to restore the heartbeat for any length of time and to get that person back to quality of life that they, they would want. Not because of the primary heart problem, but because of the all the other diseases that, that have caused it in, in the first place. So whilst you rightly say, as far as the person is concerned, of course, whether it happens in or out of hospital makes little difference. Um, it does make quite a bit of difference in, in the strategies that we might use to try and deal with, with the problem. So in hospital, the focus is very much on prevention of the cardiac arrest occurring in the first place because we so often have warning signs that, that the cardiac arrest is going to occur and we need to step in and, and, and treat that person effectively to stop it. Whereas for the out of hospital setting, you often don't have, the, I mean, the luxury, if you like, it's not a great term to use perhaps, but the, you know, the awareness that there is going to be a problem happening. So they are, and I often say this when I'm teaching, you know, doctors and nurses that they are very, very different disease states, although they're both cardiac arrests. Everything about it, in, 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 in leading into the cardiac arrest, is very different. So, how, how does that affect the sort of stats? Do, do, do they get recorded separately? Yes. So, most of the statistics that that we're talking about now, and, and, and are perhaps more widely known in the media, relate to out of hospital cardiac arrest. We have statistics for in hospital cardiac arrest, and in fact, the United Kingdom is probably one of the few countries in the world where we have now national statistics, i.e. most hospitals, in fact, it's about 90% plus of hospitals in England send all their data into what's called the National Cardiac Arrest Audit. So we can we can understand what's happening in, in, in hospital and try and, and, and try and improve the situation. And again, because it's a different disease state, the focus for in-hospital cardiac arrest is not just preventing the cardiac arrest happening, but but encouraging the discussions with between nurses, doctors, and patients about whether somebody would want to be resuscitated if they did have a cardiac arrest. Because of course, you know, sadly for many patients in hospital, they're, they're very ill. It may actually reflect a, an illness that, that, that that's going to end their life, whatever we do. In other words, a terminal illness. And to attempt resuscitation under those circumstances 
um, would not be the right thing to do for that for that person. And so the concept of deciding ahead of time that resuscitation would not be appropriate um, means that that person is not exposed to really what's quite an aggressive intervention. And of course, that means then that if somebody does die in hospital, the, the, they're not going to have CPR attempted with all the potential indignity that that involves. And so, so you can see a very different strategy evolving between out of hospital and hospital cardiac arrest. I mean, I imagine that's a whole different podcast on its own about the subject of the do not resuscitate scenarios. It is, and if you haven't done a podcast on that, then then I think it's you know it's vitally important because I think I think this is a discussion that must be had between between the public and and healthcare providers because it's very much in the public's in you know the patient's interest to uh, to to do that. And again, uh, without wishing to fly the you know the British flag you know overly strongly, I think we probably lead the world in in trying to to encourage such discussions and, and put that into practice and implement those strategies. A common question within the group is that if someone's had a cardiac arrest, they're extremely worried about having what you may call a routine type operation, you know, maybe a bunion or something or a tennis elbow or whatever. Is there anything you can say to these people who are going for these sort of routine operations post-arrest? Because they are very worried about it happening again. So if, if they are patients that have had um, a cardiac arrest and it's been caused by a heart problem, for example, a blocked artery, we mentioned that earlier on, then it's often the case that that blocked artery has been dealt with, usually in the form of you know placing stents to open the artery up. And if that patient has been restored to you know a good quality of life and doesn't have any problems with continued angina, breathlessness, etc., then the risk for that person of undergoing either general anesthesia or, or indeed what we call regional anesthesia, where we use spine, you know, spinal anesthetics or local anesthetic techniques, the, the risk for that person would be very small, particularly for for relatively small operations such as bunions, as you've mentioned. It's probably fair to say that for very large operations, depending what the cause of their cardiac arrest was, they may have a slightly increased risk under anesthesia, not so much of, of cardiac arrest, but of other, other problems that can occur, but it would be probably tiny. And it's the sort of discussion that would be importantly had between that, that patient and the, the anaesthetist and the surgeons involved with the surgery. Because these days, you know, the medical profession will be very, very honest with patients and if there was genuinely an increased risk, then it's something that would be discussed so that the patient themselves could decide whether or not um, going ahead with an operation was, you know, on the balance between you know, risk and benefit was the right thing to do. But overall, I think I would be reassuring and say I think the relative risk is, is tiny. Of course, the other thing to say is if you're in a group of patients that's had some sort of sudden arrhythmia problem you know so it's so an electrical problem with the heart that's caused a cardiac arrest then during surgery of course you you are continually monitored we have defibrillators of course immediately available so it's the one time when if if a very very rare situation evolves and a cardiac arrest occurs we should better deal with that very very quickly and very effectively you, you answered my next question there, which is in, in a situation like myself where I've got an ICD, I believe they actually turn it off while you're operated on. Yes. Yeah. And, and the reason is, 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 is uh, obviously other electrical equipment is used during the operation, you know, particularly diathermy machines, which are used to coagulate blood vessels and stop bleeding. And they can cause interference. Well, there's a number of problems. They can cause interference with the ICD and you can get sort of electrical pathways going down it. So for a number of reasons, they are deactivated beforehand. But of course, you know, we would have external defibrillators available. And in fact, in some cases, if it was really thought to be a high risk, we would even apply defibrillation patches, um, you know, beforehand so that we can actually provide a defibrillatory shock if absolutely necessary very quickly. One of the sort of uh, common themes that you see um, publicised with these sort of organisations of the RC UK and ERC and, and other ones interested in CPR is, is the concept of the chain of survival. C can you tell me about that and what you see the current challenges are with it? Yes, and the chain of survival is a, a concept whereby, so the chain has a number of links. There are a number of versions out there, but the version that we use generally in Europe is, is four links. And it's really, it's describing that the sequence of events that need to be in place 
to ensure that the the person not just survives their cardiac arrest but survives with with a quality of life that they would want, hopefully back to normal in essence. And it starts really with recognition of the cardiac arrest and, and alerting the emergency medical services, then moving on to bystander CPR, the provision of early defibrillation, if that's appropriate, if it's, the, if it's a cardiac arrest of that type, and then finally the post-resuscitation care phase. And I think the, the developments more recently and importantly is the recognition that whilst all of those links are vitally important, if, and if that chain is broken, in other words, if one link doesn't work, somebody, for example, has ventricular fibrillation, a rhythm that will respond to a shock, and that shock is very delayed, then even if all the other links are in place, if the shock's been very delayed in its delivery, then sadly that person may not may not survive. We recognise now that, that then they're perhaps not all of equal importance in that the relative contribution to survival comes much more from the early links in the chain of survival. So recognising immediately that somebody may have a cardiac arrest and alerting emergency services is vitally important because even if a few minutes are lost in that process, then even if all the other bits fall into place and eventually somebody receives a shock and they get into, say, an intensive care unit afterwards, if somebody hasn't alerted emergency services and provided bystander CPR right from the outset, and sadly, that person may not make a recovery. So the chain of survival is all about making sure that all bits of it are intact. But but we need, I think, the recognition to focus particularly on those early links if we're going to make a difference to, to survival. So the, the early links are all about getting the pulse back. And that's where the, the, the general public is key, really, isn't it? And yeah, the, so the, the first two links are about, I mean, well, things are changing because the public are, are more and more involved now all the way up, of course, to the potentially to the defibrillation link. So certainly they're involved in alerting emergency services, providing the information that, that suggests to the dispatcher that somebody might be in cardiac arrest. They're involved then in, in providing you know, at least chest compressions to try and circulate blood around, to, particularly to the heart and brain, to try and keep it alive until the heart can be restarted so that it beats itself. And then increasingly, of course, with the so-called public access defibrillation, in other words, the availability of defibrillators out there in the community for use by bystanders, then potentially they can even then deliver an electric shock and, as you say, actually get the heart restarted even before the emergency services arrive. And that, I think, is where the greatest innovation is occurring and the greatest impact on survival rates is occurring because it means that we can get hearts restarted within just a few minutes and, and not have to wait for the arrival of the emergency medical services. So how are we doing in the UK compared to the rest of Europe and the world as far as getting the public involved? I think I, I, it's not perfect. I think we're doing very well. Uh, there are some parts of the world where there's been really strong in initiatives in, in public access defibrillation. And I'm thinking of somewhere like um, Japan, interestingly, actually. If, if you ever travel to Japan, you see AEDs almost everywhere. Just as an aside, it's fascinating, actually, that Japanese are obsessed about vending machines and you can get almost anything in a vending machine and increasingly including an AED because what they recognize is that every Japanese person knows where their local vending machine is and so they put the uh, AEDs in there with big big signs up and so if the, you know if somebody witnesses a cardiac arrest they get there very quickly and know where it is but i i think the the thing about the UK is people like you know, professor Douglas Chamberlain hugely responsible for getting defibrillators out there initially, of course, in train stations, airports, and then all sorts of public places like sports centres, anywhere where there are a large number of people. And, and I think the UK has done pretty well in doing that. Um, we recognise still that if you look at the overall number of people that have a cardiac arrest that receive a shock, relatively few still are getting those from so-called public access defibrillators, but it is increasing quite substantially. And there has been some very interesting um, information published by a, a group within Europe showing just how, how much of an increase those survivors are. So if you look at the survivors overall who receive an electric shock, who receive a defibrillation in the, in, you know, out of hospital, you can see it's increasingly being delivered by bystanders and then you know, it's a diminishing proportion by the EMS. So it's, it's, it's changing quite rapidly. You, you mentioned uh, that Holland or the Netherlands was at the top of the list in Europe. Yeah. 
Uh, are they good at particularly good at that? They are. And in fact, actually, the group, the, uh, you know, the group I just mentioned is very focused on on the Netherlands. It includes other European countries as well, but the Netherlands is is, is the lead of that group, and they they definitely I, I would put them at the top of the league for that community response, and particularly in 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 the form of getting bystanders using defibrillators. So uh, we can look at them and and perhaps follow their example. But I wouldn't, in no way, would I put the UK down on that. I think we're doing extremely well. And of course, there are other innovations which you may have discussed in previous podcasts, such as the Good Sam app, you know, where where volunteers can can download the app to their smartphone and be potentially alerted to a cardiac arrest nearby so that they can then respond and be potentially directed to pick up the nearest public access defibrillator whilst responding to the person in cardiac arrest. I mean, I haven't interviewed anyone with regards to the app directly, but it is certainly in my on my radar because I think it's a, a key part of the picture, really. Absolutely. And it's a fascinating topic, which I think your listeners would be really, really keen on, on, on hearing. And of course, it's not by, although it's been led by, in fact, a neurosurgeon in, in London, it's not just a UK project. This is going worldwide. And certainly, you know, Australia, for example, is very, very active in the use of the Good Sam app. And I think using that smartphone technology, where, of course, by because because they're using GPS, people's location can be identified. I mean, some people may be worried about that, of course, but in essence, you're using the benefits of that technology to be able to locate volunteers who happen to be nearby when a cardiac arrest occurs. And so if the emergency medical services dispatchers can locate those people they can then send them text messages and direct them to the scene of the cardiac arrest and, and that that sort of technology is being rolled out across the world but the good sam system is probably the world leader actually in there i, w- I would like to come back on to the subject of technology in a, in a little bit but just to finish off on the on the chain of survival the sort of the latter links the the returning quality of life to someone how, how do you think we're doing on that part because that's i know it's a, of a particular interest to many people in the Southern Cardiac Arrest UK and also around the world because I know a lot of challenges present themselves in that stage for that person because you're pretty oblivious to all the rest of it, to tell the truth. You've got, you're not conscious most of it and you don't have any memory of it afterwards. So that's the bit that interests us. No, and of course, perhaps not having a memory of it is I would potentially a good thing, I suspect, although not everybody would agree with that. And I think it comes back to, to whilst the focus is on what we do to to people who have survived their cardiac arrest, but perhaps and the majority will end up to start with unconscious on intensive care units, I'd still, before I touch on that, would, would emphasise, of course, that what has happened early on in terms of how good was somebody's CPR, how quickly were the emergency medical services contacted, those things still are by far the biggest determinants of somebody's quality of life at the end of the process. We, in the intensive care world, and of course that's where I do a lot of my work clinically, we've recognised that we can do a lot to improve the quality of somebody's survival in terms of what we do in the intensive care unit. And we're learning to really fine tune the treatment that we provide patients, whether it be the correct oxygen levels, you know, the correct blood pressure, using temperature control, for example, to try and improve the brain's recovery, then we're we're doing that. And I think we're doing that quite well in the United Kingdom compared with, with elsewhere in the world. And the reason I say that is that is that one of the benefits of a national health service is that we're able to produce guidelines and roll out standards and and really make sure those are implemented across all hospitals. And we can do that quite effectively. Whereas in many other countries, if they don't have a national healthcare system, it's quite difficult to, to, to implement like that across all hospitals. And you get a much more sort of bit by bit implementation. So that's the sort of in-hospital bit. But of course, there is all the, the rehabilitation that needs to come afterwards. And I'm sure that's an area that you and your listeners are, you know, are, are keen to hear about. I, and I think you know, sadly, what we seem to be able to deliver is is cardiac rehabilitation, in other words, rehabilitation for the heart. But I think we've still been quite slow in delivering the sort of rehabilitation of the brain, if you like. And of course, you know, you will recognise the 
the brain is perhaps the most sensitive organ in, in the body to a period of lack of oxygen and lack of blood flow, i.e. cardiac arrest. And it's perhaps the one organ that if everything else in the body is fixed and seems to be back to normal, the, the brain can sometimes be an issue. And, and, you know, your listeners will be aware there may be memory problems, all sorts of, you know, cognitive and emotional problems. And I don't think we, we are yet very good at providing the support service um, for those sorts of issues. We're aware of it, and we are, we are I think, slowly getting there, but we're, we're some way behind. And that applies, by the way, not just actually to cardiac arrest, but, for example, to any patient that's been on, on an intensive care unit for any length of time, for example. Many of the same issues apply and we not yet really put the the correct amount of resources towards that that challenge. I mean, you, you mentioned that uh, part of the RCUK and ERC sort of remit is is being able to provide guidelines, and in particular the UK to the NHS. Is is this part of the picture going to be something that you can affect and change in the near future so that people do get better care once they've been discharged from the hospital? That that rehabilitation process will be smoother, more integrated, perhaps? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I can answer that directly by saying, first of all, importantly, later this year, there will be new resuscitation guidelines. In fact, worldwide, there'll be new resuscitation guidelines so that and they'll be published in it's the 21st of October or thereabouts of this year. Now, within the European Resuscitation Council guidelines, these are all being prepared and written at the moment based on what science we have. And I can tell you that we've specifically allocated somebody with considerable expertise in in post-cardiac arrest rehabilitation, in fact, probably two or three people actually, to write guidance on how best to implement rehabilitation services so we will clearly have guidelines for the european side of that we will take as we do with all the european guidelines what the uk does is then really take those and then adapt them a little bit for for the uk healthcare service but in essence they're identical so the short answer is we will be having guidance on rehabilitation after cardiac arrest now that's not the same as getting it implemented of course you know sadly I and my colleagues don't have the power just to suddenly be able to find the resources to put this into the, into into our hospitals. But at least it's a starting point. If we've got international guidance that clearly is is recommending introduction of rehabilitation services, then hopefully we can use that as a lever to uh, to try and get the resources to actually do it. That's absolutely fantastic to hear that that's going to be happening. And um, is is there a part in the process that a sudden cardiac arrest or its members can play to pressure whoever the powers may be to actually implement this as well? Well, I think there's a number of opportunities for survivors and, and, and the public in general to, to contribute to that. We are, for the first time, going to be putting these guidelines out for public consultation later this year. So there will be a chance to see drafts of the guidelines and then people can, can send in comments on them. And, that, and when I say people, I don't just mean healthcare providers, it would be everybody. So, so that's an opportunity to sort of encourage that. And then once the guidelines are published, then for sure, you know, groups such as the cardiac, cardiac arrest survivors groups are incredibly important because I think, you know, to be completely frank, I think on politicians and the like are far more uh, likely to, to, to listen to support groups such as, such as that than they are perhaps to people like me. <laughs> because, um, and that's, you know, that's been very frank, but I think it's true. So the short answer is it's extremely important to, 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 get, to get the relevant members of the public on board to push for that. I understand that these guidelines change or are reviewed roughly every five years. And how have we done before? How have, how have the guidelines done before? Have they usually been implemented? So, yes, they, they have been generally. Um, there's new guidelines published every five years or so. Um, we are trying to review the science on a slightly more regular basis. And if there was important science that came out suggesting we should change the way we treat people after cardiac arrest, then we would introduce it even before those five yearly stages. In terms of how well we've done, I think it's it's always difficult. There's, there's a quite a delay between publishing any clinical guidelines and then seeing a change in practice. Some people would say the delay can be as long as five years. So, of course, that covers the entire cycle. 
And I think probably we've been quite good in some areas, but less less good in others. And and sadly, I think rehabilitation is an example where we've been slightly less good because there was some guidance guidance on rehabilitation in 2015, but we're st- we're only just beginning to see that beginning to creep in in certain centres. It's certainly not across the board. So we we could do better. Is the short answer to your question? And would one of those guidelines be anything to do with outcome measures? Because at the moment, I understand that patients perhaps are assessed on their CPC or their MRS scales, which is the cerebral performance category and modified ranking scale. Would that be correct? Well, the, I mean, yes and no. Th- those are the scales by which, at the very least, we would like to see patients formally assessed on. I think if I was honest with you, we don't necessarily have even those assessments done for for every patient, every survivor of cardiac arrest. They're certainly done in the context of clinical studies and, and trials, but it's quite difficult to capture those data to, for everybody. The reason being is that the, the, so those are functional scales broadly, and they will try and assign a it's assigning a number on a scale for somebody that's you know the highest number would be somebody restored completely to totally normal and going down to the worst case scenario of of somebody with severe you know um, permanent brain injury which which is rare i must emphasize and it does involve somebody assessing that person to some extent and actually recording that information and it's not necessarily done for all for all patients at the moment so we could even improve on the capture of of the data and and information relating to those scales but i think perhaps what you're hinting at is that those are quite i'll use the word crude scales in other words they don't pick up subtleties of of for example subtleties in somebody's personality that may have altered slightly after a cardiac arrest very subtle memory disturbances after cardiac arrest. Those scales completely miss that. And what you need is far more sophisticated so-called cognitive assessments to be able to capture those particular issues and challenges. And that would require quite a lot of resources because they're quite difficult assessments to, to undertake. And we would certainly want to see that eventually, but, but I told you that even getting that information after clinical trials, even for those, it's really difficult to capture. And I've been involved in at least a couple of very large clinical trials recently. And we try very hard to get that, that, that data, but we probably only get it in about half, you know, the, the, half of the survivors. And that's in a very heavily funded clinical trial setting. So you can appreciate to do that as part of routine clinical care right now would be really difficult. I I totally understand that. And you you did sort of understand the nub of my question there is, do do you think there could be a cardiac arrest specific scale? That's a good question. And and that's one that's not, to my knowledge, been been openly discussed because the the scales that we've mentioned, I mean, the the CPC scale is much more focused on cardiac arrest. In fact, the the, the, um, you know, cerebral performance category scale. The the other one you mentioned, the so-called modified ranking scale, was originally derived from, from use in, in patients who'd had strokes, and we've just used it for cardiac arrest. So it's entirely possible that we could adapt those and create a, a specific scale for, for cardiac arrest, but I'm not sure if that would resolve, the, I, I guess, the problem, the challenge you, 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 that, that, that concerns you. Because you would still need a, some sort of assessment scale that was sufficiently detailed to pick up subtle cognitive changes, which can be subtle, but can mass- as I don't need to tell you and your listeners, can massively affect somebody's quality of life. And we would need really to be able to um, develop a system that wasn't going to necessarily take up a huge amount of resources to do maybe technology would be the answer and of course a lot of these assessments can be done online of course and there may be ways of dealing with that so it's something which i'm sure we need to look into more i mean i I just sort of very wary of the sort of uh the coarseness of the cpc scale where you know one is classed as good and i think five is is uh someone's deceased and four's in a permanent vegetative state, I believe. And we don't actually see many of those or many threes, I believe. So would that be true? Uh, Yes. Now, this is a sensitive area. 
there is an, an, it, 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 an clearly interesting area that, that, that there are wide international differences here. And this is when we start to get into ethics and, and morals, if you like. I think that in general in the United Kingdom, and I'm, I'm being, I'm generalizing hugely here. So if there are listeners that have very strong views one way or the other, I, you know, this is a generalization of my perception of how we behave and what our thought processes are in the UK versus some other, some other places. When we can be very confident that somebody very sadly is not going to make a good outcome by their judgment and by their family's judgment, then we in the, in the United Kingdom will tend to change our focus of treatment to one of comfort care for that person and recognizing that that person wouldn't want to be kept alive under all circumstances and to end up in, as you've described it, either a vegetative state or with some other form of very severe permanent brain injury. And so the focus is then on comfort care for that person. And, and sadly, in many cases, they then don't survive the cardiac arrest and perhaps you know, die sometime later. In other cultures and other systems, there is a different view on that. And that they will tend to treat um, relentlessly for, uh, to try and uh, keep that person alive for as long as possible. And in those cultures and in those countries, there's a much higher incidence of, of survivors with with really severe brain damage. So it, it's a very difficult area. You can't separate medicine from culture and, and, and religion and, and different countries, if you like. Um, and therefore, it makes it very, very difficult to generalize. But broadly, broadly, in answer to your question in the United Kingdom, we don't have very large numbers of survivors with, with very severe brain injury after cardiac arrest. But with the, uh, I, I totally understand that. And it, like you say, it's a very sensitive area and probably needs a lot of study in, in various aspects. But going back to the, the, the CPC uh, scale and how we will be classed as probably, or most of the people in, in the Southern Cardiac Arrest UK group would be classed as a one, which is a good, but that can still, it still acknowledges that there may be problems. And I, I feel that just the label that that is good sort of covers up a whole multitude of sins, as it were, and that 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 label, if you like, it isn't very helpful. That it is good, uh, and that people sort of overlook the problems that patients potentially have. I completely agree with you, Paul. And in fact, I'd probably go wider than that because technically, as I'm, as, I'm, as you probably know, in, in in the setting of research, particularly in cardiac arrest, actually good is both cerebral performance category or CPC1 and 2. And if you look at CPC2, and by the way, those, I guess, broadly define a person who's capable of inde independent existence is, is a term that I will often use to describe it. But within CPC2, there, there's, there can be quite significant disability and impairment and, and as you say, even in one, it doesn't pick up you know, major cognitive issues, major personality changes. And it certainly, there can be a, a very large number of people who would be classified as CPC1 who certainly would not get back to their normal work, for example, which, which can be devastating for, for, for patients. So I, I completely agree. They are very, very crude scales. And we really should be focusing on, on trying to understand the variability within the CPC1 and 2 categories and then trying to, to do our best to look at treatments that actually improve the outcome for individuals within those two categories. What we can say, where, where there are, I think, quite a lot of inf data or information now is around patients who get back to work and, and it's surprising that, that that there are statistics showing that of those that were working to start with, quite a high proportion do get back to work. But again, even those studies are not really delving into the into the details because, of course, it may be that people get back to work, but they're not actually doing exactly the job they were doing before, or they're not able to work full time. Whole number of nuances to that. But we are there are you know there's some information about it but it's not perfect. 
I totally agree. I mean, I see that a lot in the group where people are asking about going back to work and sometimes they're forced back to work for whether that's their employer or their financial situation. And I I think I've done a couple of polls and it's roughly about 80% who, or 70 to 80% who managed to go back to some form of work, like you're saying, not necessarily their original job. That which is interesting. So if those if those are polls that you've done, that actually fits, I think, pretty well with some of the Australian. Probably some of the best data in terms of very long term outcomes is it comes out of Australia. Actually, there's a group in Melbourne, Australian, where where they're very good at following cardiac arrest survivors for quite a long time, and they they I think have shown very very similar figures for for of course people who were in work to start with. Okay, well, we've been talking about the patient there, but what about the forgotten patient, i.e. the, the so-called bystanders or, or the lay rescuers and the, and the partners and other family members that have uh, been affected by the, the survivor's event? Are there going to be any guidelines for them going forward, do you think? The the European Resuscitation Council guidelines, I think, will be, and, and uh, to be honest with you, I can't remember whether we mentioned this at all in 2015 i suspect we did not but i think that we are going to have some discussion about it for 2020 not least because there are some studies out there now looking at the at the impact on bystanders and actually not just out of hospital but there's certainly been some work which i think is still ongoing actually looking at by, bystanders in hospital because of course patients who are in a hospital ward who happen to, to be there at the time when you know, sadly, a, a, a patient next to them in the same ward has a cardiac arrest, and then they actually see all you know, the, the sort of commotion that goes on. They're affected as well, so so they become a bit like the family of somebody, if you like, of, of somebody who has a cardiac arrest out of hospital. I think we've done very little for those individuals so far, but I it would not be I would not be at all surprised if there was a significant incidence, incidence of post traumatic stress disorder amongst such people because it's a very distressing event to see and be involved with but at the moment we have comparatively few data or little information about that yeah i would certainly back up the fact that it is quite distressing from uh, a partner or anyone involved point of view and i understand that's also for the professionals as well i know a couple of medical professionals who've you know had all the training they've done it in hospital or a medical environment many times and it hasn't affected them but then taken out and they're in the field and they haven't got all the equipment the backup the support staff and it's a whole different ball game and that has affected them quite drastically but it would be really good to see something specifically for the forgotten patient because I, I know it is a big problem and I did a survey, again, of people who have been involved with the chain of survival, how many people actually got any help afterwards, and the majority had no help. They had to deal with it on their own. And quite often when they're maybe a family member or a partner, the focus obviously is all on the survivor, and and that's partly why they are the forgotten patient, as it were. I, I I agree with you entirely, Paul. And I think I've just literally just while you were discussing that, and then I was trying to find so so, so that we are moving forward on this. So first of all, I I agree that firstly, I think there will be a significant incidence of of quite significant stress or even po- you know truly post traumatic stress disorder following the witnessing and participating in the resuscitation following a cardiac arrest, and that that is true both out of hospital and in, and it affects both um, the public and and healthcare providers. And as you say, a healthcare provider that's used to working entirely in hospital who then deals with a situation out of hospital um, suddenly finds it way more more stressful because they're out of their normal clinical background. But recently, and we, we've published, it's a, a group of doctors from Bath, actually, and I'm, I'm a co-author on the paper, although by no means the main person that did the work. But we've shown amongst um, doctors and nurses involved in resuscitation in hospital, so in their in their usual setting, that following such uh, resuscitation attempts, something like 10, the figure we came out with, 10% of the doctors and nurses involved in those resuscitations screened positively for post-traumatic stress disorder. So using a formal screening tool to make that diagnosis, 10% of them. Wow. And th- these are healthcare providers working in their own environment. So that must be an underestimate, surely, of, of those involved out of hospital. It is, it is. And also, to sort of tack on to that, the, 
the the lay rescuers or the bystanders who are involved in an out of hospital scenario. I know many of these take place at home. I think it's about 80% of them or 70, 80% in a domestic environment. But those ones where maybe you've got strangers taking part in the resuscitation or you've got people from other services such the fire brigade or the police who are involved, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect in actually bringing those people together again to be able to say, or to inform them how the patient did, to let them know whether they they did, a, well, obviously anyone involved, they did a good job, but there should be some learning points perhaps for them. But also there's a big part for the actual patient and the family to say thank you, you know, whether it was a good outcome or not, to say thank you for trying at least, you know. Is there any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, th- this is it's potentially quite a challenging area. So again, within the in-hospital setting, just to give an ex- that example first, which is much easier to deal with, we've only relatively recently un- understood the importance of so-called debriefing, formal debriefing. And now you'll find in, after a, a cardiac arrest in hospital and a resuscitation attempt, there's nearly always a debriefing that pulls together all the relevant people involved to, d- to discuss what went on. And that's, that is partly to deal with some of the stress and psychological issues that can can affect them. So that's the in-hospital setting. So if we move that kind of concept, which I think you've you've broadly outlined just now, to the out-of-hospital setting, it would be obviously really valuable if we could achieve that. But the challenges are enormous. First of all, you have professionals from all different branches and you've cited a few there from the ambulance service it could be from the fire service they were they were responding early a whole number of different groups and to try and get them together at a particular time in place to have that debrief would would be a challenge then i think the even bigger one of course is around confidentiality and this is a difficult area because there will be many patients and families who are desperately keen to to have the opportunity to thank all those involved in saving their loved one but others may not feel the same way so we can't make the assumption that that they're happy to do that so there would have to be some form of consenting process you know for that to happen so i think it 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 could be done i think we could learn from what's going on in the in-hospital setting where it's much easier to implement that process and then try to maybe set up some sort of debriefing process for out of hospital. But I completely accept and fully understand that right now there will be members of the public and family members involved in resuscitation attempts who get really no support at all unless they were to run into really severe psychological problems when they would obviously have to go down the, you know, the usual track. But that's leaving it a little bit late. And you really want to deal with the issue so that you don't develop those problems. It's a preventive, preventative thing, really. Absolutely. And uh, the country that you mentioned earlier that's doing really well with the stats on survival, Netherlands, there's a system there, I think it's called Heart for All, where it's a kind of uh, online system that allows people to come together after the event. So it, it can be done, and maybe it's a model that we can look at and use in the UK as well, or a wider. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it would be excellent to provide that opportunity. And then, as you say, if people are actually going online and, and if they know the resources there, they are clearly going online to tap into that. So, you know, clearly the consent is there and then, then that becomes less of an issue. But it is true. The Netherlands keeps coming up, doesn't it? And the Netherlands are at the forefront of all of this. And indeed, I mentioned, you know, that, that we have experts contributing to the ERC guidelines on on rehabilitation, etc. And um, it's no surprise to learn that the lead expert there is from the Netherlands. That's, that's good to hear. It, would that be Veronique Miller? It, it would indeed. <laughs> <laughs> good. You, you touched on technology just there, and uh, I mentioned it as well previously. How, how do you think that's going to frame this whole picture? How, how can we use it going forward to, to better survival? Well, I think technology... Some people hate technology and some people love it, but I think it's it's there. It's 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 going to be increasingly involved in our lives, and it's definitely helping with improving outcome from from cardiac arrest. We've already mentioned perhaps the most important element, and that's the Good Sam app uh, and similar apps around the world. So the concept that you can have volunteers who sign up, they download the app on their phone, they can be located at any time, 
if they wish. They can be alerted, alerted of a cardiac arrest nearby and they can choose to respond or, or not and may or may not be directed to a defibrillator. So that, that is clearly an example of technology in action, which, which I'm sure can make a difference to, to outcomes. At the other end of the scale, which is exciting, interesting, yet to be proven, is, of course, the use of drones to deliver automated external defibrillators to the scene of a cardiac arrest. These potentially can be used in remote areas where it would take otherwise a very long time for the EMS to, to respond. I still think those are, whilst there, there are live systems in place, certainly in Nevada, there's a live system. In other words, they already have the drones ready to go and to be used. We yet, we've yet to know whether they really are going to impact outcome or whether that's just a, a kind of fancy use of, of technology, which is fanciful rather than effective. But that's an interesting development. I think there's some really interesting areas in terms of artificial intelligence. So there's some studies that have come out of Denmark from the Copenhagen group there, where they've been using artificial intelligence to analyze the communications between a bystander that witnesses a potential cardiac arrest and the dispatcher. And they can use the artificial intelligence to analyze that conversation and potentially detect the likelihood that, that the person being described is in cardiac arrest before the dispatcher even gets there, as it were. And so supporting the dispatcher in the decision to decide, is this, does this sound like it's a cardiac arrest? Let's send the, you know, the emergency vehicles now. That, that I think, is a, is a very clever use of it. So I think that will come in. And then, of course, there's, there's a whole rat ra- of examples we have in this, getting a lot more technical, perhaps, but... Defibrillators, of course, are are evolving very, very rapidly. They've come down considerably in cost now. There's now the concept of the completely disposable defibrillator, which basically is a bit like a block, which is not much bigger than a smartphone and can just sit in, for example, taxis. And they just it just sits there for years. And if it gets used, it gets replaced. You know, and it's capable of delivering a number of shocks and then simply is disposed or if it's used afterwards and replaced. And they are very cheap. I've never heard of those. I, I have group. They're just, just coming out now. I'm trying to think which country evolved that technology. I think it's from somewhere in, in Asia. And they've certainly been demonstrated at recent resuscitation conferences. Those are very interesting. And there's definitely um, interest from groups like cabs where well of course there are already some cabs that hold ADs that have ADs and they've got little stickers on them that say that just because cabs are out and about in the community they can be directed rapidly to a cardiac arrest there's, there's way more cabs than there are ambulances you know these are all you know novel concepts that, that just cut that delay they cut down on the time between somebody having an arrest and getting a defibrillation attempt and so that's out there, and that I'm sure that that will that will you know that will change the scene quite quite a bit in the next year or two. You know, we have a lot of technology going on, obviously within within the hospital, even within the critical care world. But I think actually, I won't go into details about that because I think those are those are subtle things that might make small changes and small differences. I think the big impact is is that you know the likes of Good Sam possibly. You know, defibrillators so inexpensive that you can just have them everywhere. Those are the things that are going to make a big difference. What do you think about Alexa, the Amazon device, giving CPR training and also being able to recognise agonal uh, breathing? Yeah, yes. No, I, I am I am aware of that. I was fascinated by the, the, the certainly the reports around agonal breathing. And just to explain that, so that was Alexa obviously listening to, to sounds and, and if, if somebody has a cardiac arrest often there will be bre- abnormal breathing so-called gasping breathing that can go on for potentially a few minutes after a cardiac arrest and reportedly alexa was 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 you know very good at picking up agonal breathing as a sign that somebody may have a cardiac arrest so i i yeah, I think it's out there. I, that's clearly not for for um, implementation at, at the moment, but there's definitely a scope to look at that technology and do it. And of course, the other area which I didn't mention, which which is again interesting, is these smartwatches and the fact that smartwatches, of course, are are um, you know rhythm monitors, if you like, in the crudest sense. And there has been, as you may know, a very large study published on diagnosing an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation where where chambers of the heart beat very very fast and irregularly 
and these smartwatches are are very capable of picking that up and detecting it perhaps before the patient's even aware they have a problem. So the, in the extreme case, of course, you know, you could have a smartwatch that's capable of detecting somebody that's gone into cardiac arrest and then it, it alerts the emergency services. That by that is, to my knowledge, not actually happening, but that is a, an example, conceptual example of what can happen in the future. Okay, I think I'm sort of coming to the end of my questions, really. Would you be able to sort of sum up for the listeners where do you think the next few years is going to be going with resuscitation and survival rates? Well, I, I think my my prediction, and I, one must be optimistic, is that survival rates will, will be slowly increasing. And I will, I, for out of hospital, I use the words slowly because I guess one thing we haven't touched on is that, 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 that overall survival rates are slowly slowly increasing, but, but there's actually quite a substantial increase in the survival rates if one was to focus just on patients that have a sudden you know, ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest, so a sudden collapse out of hospital because of a, of a primary heart problem. The survival rates there are, are increasing substantially. And whilst we mentioned a figure of 9% for the UK earlier on, for those particular patients, it's much closer to 30% and, and rising fast. So so there is, there's hope there, I think, for, for the future. And then I think where's it going to go in terms of really the, the big, and as the Americans might say, the biggest bang for the buck, it's got to be in the community response. It's got to be in teaching people to recognise a cardiac arrest and to respond to emergency services. And importantly, the one thing we haven't mentioned, or I haven't mentioned, which I should, of course, is, is now the introduction of mandatory life skills training in schools, because I think that's going to be a, you know, a substantial innovation, not because I'm expecting lots and lots of children to be doing CPR on, on, on people. That's probably not how it works. But the fact that the children learn it very early on, they will tend to tell their parents about it and friends about it. And you, you have this sort of multiplier effect where more and more people just be, begin to realise that actually, you know, I need to know this stuff and this is just about life. It's not an extra part of life. It's just, you know, everyday thing. And I think that will have a huge impact. Do you think we could have it part of the driving test? Because I know quite a few other countries include it. Yes, they do. Well, the, you know, the, the, the country that comes to my mind immediately is Denmark. They introduced compulsory CPR training before you could have a driver's license. And they did that, I think, more than 10 years ago. And of course, what they've then shown is, is, a, is a huge increase in both bystander CPR rates, so the number of times that somebody actually does something and does, does do CPR, and at the same time, a substantial increase in their survival rate. So, you know, I've just been mentioning that just now, and, and, and that Denmark figures were, were particularly in my mind. But to be fair to the UK, the, you know, if you look at the, and you can, your listeners can go to the London Ambulance Service website, if they look up London Ambulance Service Cardiac Arrest Report, they, they produce a, a very interesting report every year. And, you know, that is showing you know, clearly rising rising survival rates, particularly in the in the shock or rhythm group of patients. So uh, well over 30. In fact, I think their last report was 36 percent survival, if I've got that right. So it, it, it's definitely it is definitely getting better. So there's you know, clear hope on the horizon. Well, that's positive news. I'd just like to say it's been a fantastic conversation from my point of view, and it's been so informative to sort of put the whole picture uh, together of resuscitation in the UK and, and beyond. And I really look forward to, to seeing the uh, recommendations for the guidelines later this year and hopefully being able to feed back into them. And I look forward, is it that you mentioned the end of uh, October when they're going to be published? Yes, that's right, Paul. The, the, the guidelines, the, the full set of guidelines will be published on October the 21st. There is a possibility that we try and, and publish some of those. In fact, most relevant to your listeners will be the basic life support guidelines. They may, in fact, be published on, and this is, this is, I suppose, a, and this is not confirmed, <laughs> but there is a possibility that we try and coincide it with the World Restart of Heart Day, which, which is 16th of October every year. So the 16th of October 2020, we may try and, and publish the basic life support component because that's most relevant to the, to the World Restart of Heart Day concept. Watch, watch this space. But importantly, 
there will be an opportunity to feedback and comment on on draft guidelines earlier in the year. I can't give you the exact date for that, but it may be somewhere around the May time, I think. Will that be on the ERC and, and RC be, UK websites? It'll be on the ERC website because the what will happen is we'll, we'll receive public comment onto the ERC guidelines and they will be fed into the RC UK versions anyway. Well, thank you very much for your time today, and I really appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners do. So, Jerry, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. This concludes this episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast, and I'd love to know what you think. And you can do that via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or the website suddencardiacarrestuk.org. And you can find us by Googling Southern Cardiac Arrest UK or the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast. If you have found value in this or other episodes, please help spread the word by leaving a review on your podcast provider, such as Apple or wherever is convenient. And don't forget, if you want to know more about Life After Cardiac Arrest, check out our books, Life After Cardiac Arrest, on Amazon. Make sure you click subscribe, and I'll speak to you next time.